Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sumashita and Dr. Kolvasha for this opportunity, Dr. Aditya for the kind introduction. So I'd like to start off with my talk on anterior segment dosity, my third eye and corneal diagnosis. The outline of my presentation would be broadly uh, looking at the principles, the various devices, and the clinical applications. So OCT was first developed by Mohan et al. as a non-contact uh, method to provide higher resolution and cross-sectional energy. It differs from B-scan primarily in having a higher frequency, although it has less penetration, but in turn gives better resolution. The principle, as we all know, is based on microfilm's interferometry, where the light source is uh, received by the beam splitter and then is uh, reflected onto the reference mirror, which can be used at variable depths to obtain the image of our choice. So OCD is primarily divided into time domain and spectral domain. The time domain OCD has a wider area of capture, whereas the spectral domain OCD has a higher speed and improved axial resolution. So this is a commonly used OptoView OCD, which is a spectral domain, and this is how it looks in terms of its uh, controls. You have the video screen over here, the chin rest for the patient, and the imaging aperture. So I'll go through some common clinical applications that we commonly use OCD for. The first and most important is uh, the ocular surface formus neoplasia and differentiation from other surface tumors. As you can see over here, the three primary uh, points that are to be noted in any OCT are the thickened hyperreflective hyper epithelium, the abrupt transition of the epithelium over the lesion from the adjacent corneal epithelium, and the tissue plane of separation from the underlying stroma. So contrast this with a patient or with this clinical image of a patient 85 year old male who is diagnosed as OSS and elsewhere. If you look at this OCD carefully, you will see that although there is uh, some elevation, but there is no hyperreflectivity, nor is there transition of the epithelium from the adjacent cornea. So this patient was ultimately a case of actinic keratosis. Other benign uh, lesions on the surface of the cornea are salesman nodular degeneration. You can see uh, these gelatinous lesions, and on OCD, they have a clear plane of demarcation from the underlying stroma, and they do very well post superficial keratectomy. Another important lesion is the Timon's granuloma. You can see here a clear cystic space with um, backshadowing, as can be seen in the space over here. An important tool is also in the management of corneal dystrophies, more specifically granular corneal dystrophy. Although it is primarily a clinical diagnosis, uh, it, the OCT helps in additionally ascertaining the depth of lesions, which further helps in surgical planning. As we know, PTK is useful only for lesions up to 100 microns, whereas for lesions which are deeper than that, you would either have to resort to a FALC or a DAC. Additionally, moving on to keratoconus, the OCD classification of keratoconus utilizes the thinning of the epithelial and stromal layers of the cornea, the hyperreflectivity of the Bowman's layer, and stromal thinning, which is divided into five stages. This study looked at the predictive factors for acute corneal high drops in keratoconus, and the three major uh, fact points that were uh, noted were the presence of hyperreflectivity at the Bowman's layer, a thickened overlying epithelium, and adjacent stromal thinning. So this is a patient who developed severe hydrops. You can see the OCT over here, how the cornea is extremely thin, nearly just 150 microns, and the resonance is not even visible here. So sequential follow-up of this patient who underwent uh, compression sutures, you can see that the stroma is quite compact over here, and this is the last follow-up after a period of nearly two months, where you can see a well uh, compact and scarred cornea. Moving on to uh, uh, important indication of scleritis. So although traditionally it was a clinical diagnosis, but the role of OCT can be useful in differentiating from episcleritis. So these are pictures of non-infectious and infectious scleritis. If you look at infectious scleritis over here, there's significant back shadowing due to the presence of a nodule. Whereas in non-infectious scleritis, you look at uh, significant engorgement of the vessels and thickening of the sclera, as well as inability to localize the posterior margin of the sclera. Congenital corneal opacities, OCT plays a vital role in the diagnosis and follow-up, especially in patients with Peters anomaly, to differentiate them with associated lenticular corneal iridoid adhesions. If you look at this OCT here, you can make out that the iris is adhering to the posterior surface of the cornea. And although a UVM would be necessary to look at lenticular adhesions, this is a useful screening tool to help in further management. This is also a patient of a check where you see diffuse uh, stromal thickening and uh, also hyperreflectivity in the posterior layers of the stroma. 
A small note about refractive surgery. There are multiple uses of anterior segment OCT uh, in post basic patients for the flap thickness, residual stromal bed uh, thickness, and complications like interface fluid syndrome, intacts, and also post PRK haze and post basic ectase. So, this is a patient who had undergone LASIK elsewhere about a month ago. If you look at the OCT carefully, you will see a small hyperreflective area just below the LASIK flap. This ended up being debris, and no intervention was advised for her. Contrast this with this OCT of interface fluid syndrome, where you can see a significant uh, hyperreflective space between the flap and the stromal bed. So, this requires immediate intervention to uh, help in resolving the condition. This is a patient of epithelial inclose. You can clearly see these localized nests of epithelium that are present below the flap. And uh, this patient ultimately underwent uh, YAG to uh, disrupt the cell nests. This is the OCT of a patient who has undergone intacts. So in these conditions, the OCT helps in uh, making sure that they are in the correct depth in patients with uh, impending extrusion. And uh, they can be used to sequentially monitor follow-up. In patients with phatic IOLs, uh, it's very important because OCT helps in estimating the volt, either low or high volt, and also the orientation of the uh, uh, ICI. And uh, lastly, I'll just touch upon keratoplasty. Uh, in patients with uh, DALC, uh, to identify complications like double anterior chamber, preoperative evaluation in patients undergoing endothelial keratoplasty, and uh, patients post D6. So these are pictures of three different complications. If you look at the one on top, you'll see a significant detachment of the lenticule. The bottom uh, picture shows an inverse inverse uh, D-cell lenticule, and the right side picture shows a significant interface haze. In patients post DMEC to assess the attachment of the lenticule and also presence of uh, detachment in the periphery. Uh, post cataract surgery, uh, decimal membrane detachment can be monitored, although it is primarily clinical, but OCT helps in estimating the extent and the location of the decimal detachment. This is a patient with long standing uh, DMP who developed fixed uh, corneal folds. This in turn helps us to uh, understand the management of DMD with the help of the health algorithm. Uh, in a short period of time, I will skip this. And lastly, OCT angiography, although it is highly subjective in the follow up of patients with uh, ocular burns, it, uh, in the initial stages and sequential stages, it can help in assessing follow up. So, uh, finally, I would like to end with the deco message that OCT is an essential tool in the argumentative of the corneal practitioner, both for diagnosis and sequential follow up post intervention. Thank you very much.